hopefully I get everything done and on the computer uh, um, this afternoon. So I think we're ready to rumble here. So Barbara, take it away. Let us now join in to our call to worship as found in your bulletins and the, the um, service that was mailed out to you one way or another. Rise up, O Lord. Do not let mortals prevail. Let the nations be judged before you. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will tell of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. Amen. Now Jeff will lead us in Lead Me, Lord. together in our congregational prayer, saying together, O Lord, our God, our hearts are open to you, even in all their messiness and insecurities. We have given those hearts to you, O Lord, for you have called us to be your children. You know all our thoughts and intentions. You know our needs and desires. Help us, O oh God, to accept one another as you have accepted us. You saw what a mess we were at one time, and you granted us mercy in spite of ourselves. You sent your Son to take our sin upon himself 
and bestowed upon us your forgiveness for all our messes. We thank you, O Lord. We praise you for your mercy and grace. Help us to be worthy of that grace in our relations with one another. Help us to be open with one another in all our troubles and through all our trials. Let us be your heart in the world, the people who live in your love and bring your kingdom to this earth in which we live. In the name of your only Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Now I would ask if there are those that we need to lift up that are not on our prayer list this week. Yes, Cheryl. Okay, so we'll hold up Ruth in our prayers. Are there others? Okay, we like celebrations. Absolutely. We'll remember all the fathers with us and, and who have gone before. Amen. Are there others? I have one additional one in, um, in my uh, building, one of our neighbors. Uh, I found out this morning is in the hospital. Her name is Nancy Plant. So I would ask that you would keep her in prayer as well. So let us continue in a spirit of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we aim to be fathers like you those of us who have assumed that role, whether it is the, the um, father of our own children or the father of adopted children or the father of those who um, came into the family with our wives. Lord, we aim to be like you, to be loving and caring and nurturing men of God, people of God. And indeed, Lord, there are some families in which the father is not present for one reason or another, whether through death or through leaving the family. And the, the role of fatherhood is assumed by the mother sometimes. So we lift up them as, as they strive to be fathers as well. And Lord, we, we thank you for those on our prayer list this week. We keep lifting them up to you for their healing and for their comfort and for their peace. And Lord, we thank you for this, for the new ones that we're adding for Ruth and for Nancy. And pray as well for Janet this morning as she was unable to, to make it up here this week. So we, we thank you and praise you for her and ask for your healing. And Lord, we thank you for your example for us and especially for your son who came to save us and to forgive us. We thank you and praise you in all these things. As Jesus taught us, we continue our prayer this morning saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now we will enter into our offertory time and I would invite you if you have an envelope or uh, an offering to give to bring it up to the front and leave it in this um, plate that is on the altar while we hear from Jeff and Barbara with some special music. I told the pastor that this piece of music that we're doing today is one of the pieces, one of the primary pieces of music that helped me get through a year of our not being able to have church and COVID and all the worries and concerns that are associated, were associated with it and continue to be associated with it. Barbara. In the dark of the midnight, I have oft hid my face while the storms howl above me and there's no hiding place. Mid the crash of the thunder, precious Lord, hear my cry, keep me safe till the storm passes by till the storm passes over till the thunder sounds no more till the clouds are all forever from the sky hold me fast let me stand in the hollow Keep me safe till the storm passes by. When the long night has ended and the storms come no more, let me stand in thy presence on that bright, peaceful shore in the land where the tempest never comes lord may i dwell with thee when the storm passes by till the storm passes over till the thunder sounds no more till the clouds roll forever from the sky Let me stand in the hollow of thy hand. Keep me safe till the storm passes by. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your care for us in the midst of the storm. We know that you reach out for us. And Lord, we ask that you would be with us now as we are emerging from the storm of COVID and following you as we have before and as we continue to, to worship you in different ways as well. We thank you and praise you for your gifts to us that we can give back to you in Jesus' name, amen. So the gospel today is found in the Gospel of Mark, and it's in chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. 
On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with them. A great windstorm arose and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and the sea said to the sea, peace, be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. He said to them, why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, who is this that even the wind and the sea Obey him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Be to God. And now Jeff will lead us in our second hymn, Serenam Serenam, which means refuge. Jesus, Savior, Lord, lo to thee I fly. Saranam, Saranam, Saranam. Thou the rock, my refuge, this higher than I. Saranam, Saranam, Saranam. In the midst of foes I cry to thee. Savior, Lord, lo to thee I fly. Saranam, Saranam, Saranam. Now the rock, my refuge, is higher than I. Saranam, Saranam, Saranam. Yesterday, today, for all the same. And the Savior came, Saranam, Saranam, Saranam. Jesus, Savior, Lord, lo to thee I fly, Saranam, Saranam, Saranam. Now the rock, my refuge, is higher than I. Saranam, Saranam, Saranam. Thank you, Jeff. The rock that is higher than I, my protector, my refuge, my God. As we prepare to hear the words of uh, 1 Samuel 17, just want to give a little background on it. Now, the 17th chapter of this first book of Samuel recounts the battle between the armies of the Israelites and the Philistines. It locates the place where it took place 
and the particulars of the placement of the armies, which were under the leadership of King Saul on the Israeli side. And remember too, that this took place after David had already been anointed by Samuel to succeed Saul as king of Israel. From the previous chapter, we learn that. We read at the end of the 16th chapter that the spirit of God had departed from Saul after the anointing by David of, of David by Samuel. And David was found to be a skin, skillful musician whose music was a comfort to Saul when the spirit of evil tormented him. But this story we read today from the next chapter recounts another aspect of the blessing of, um, that was resting on David, his courage in facing enemies in battle. Enemies that the army feared and backed away from. We read, what we read is the familiar story of David's battle with Goliath, the giant of the Philistines, whom some scholars say was not actually Goliath, but some unnamed giant. But we, we are so familiar with it so that we can probably believe it was Goliath. In those days, sometimes battles were won or lost with single-handed combat. The winner of the one-on-one -on -one competition would determine the outcome of the overall fight. This is one of those competitions. And the loss to David put the entire army of the Philistines to flight. I've given you the full reading from the lectionary but we're only reading a few selected verses, the ones that you find in bold type in your bulletins, starting in verse 32. And David said to Saul, let no one's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are just a boy, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep the sheep for his father, and whenever a lion or a bear came, and took a lamb from the flock. I went after it and struck it down, rescuing the lamb from its mouth. And if it turned against me, I would catch it by the jaw, strike it down and kill it. Your servant has killed both lions and bears. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them since he has defied the armies of the living God. David said, the Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will save me from the hand of this Philistine. So Saul said to David, go and may the Lord be with you. And Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped Saul's sword over the armor and he tried in vain to walk for he was not used to them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these for I am not used to them. So David removed them. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the wadi 
and put them in his shepherd's bag in the pouch. His sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. The Philistine came on and drew near to David and his shield bearer was in front of him. When the Philistine saw David, he said to him, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the field. But David said to the Philistine, you come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This very day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the Philistine army this very day to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the earth so that all the earth may know there is a God in Israel and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not save by sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hand. When the Philistine drew near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone, slung it, and struck the Philistine in his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. This is the word of the Lord. I only read part of the story. I never realized that this story of David and Goliath was so long or so detailed in its descriptions. This Goliath had the whole army of Israel shaking in their boots in a manner of speaking. One 10 foot tall man with so much armor and so much bravado and he had to have another to bear a shield in front of him. This scripture goes into great detail describing the appearance of this giant soldier. He must have been quite impressive to behold. With his armor and javelin of such breadth and weight. And he was protected from head to toe with a bronze helmet and all that coat of mail and the armor on his legs. And another man even to carry a shield for further protection in front of him. How could anyone be expected to penetrate that covering and take on such a challenge as was issued to the army of Saul? Yet there was one who would. That one was David the son of Jesse, the keeper of the sheep, a young man who had faced lions and bears, a young man who was ruddy and handsome, as he's described several times. This was David, the courageous young man and the one who rejected the armor offered by Saul for his own protection. David just could not function in Saul's armor. 
It was too cumbersome on him, too big and too restrictive. He did not have freedom to move as he should in battle. So he reverted to the way he knew, to the shepherd's staff and pouch and sling. And he took with him five stones from the brook nearby as his weapon of choice. And he went into battle with that menacing giant in front of the whole army of Israel, I might add. But David had another advantage over the giant, and that was his faith. He had a history with God, a history of God's presence in the face of danger and God's strength to grant David victory in the face of such menaces as lions and bears who wanted to help themselves to his sheep. A hungry lion or bear would put up a fight to keep their meal, but that did not deter the shepherd from confronting and overcoming the danger and the strength of God, and then returning the sheep to the fold. This giant posed no threat to David because this giant fought in the names of his idolatrous gods. He lacked the protection that David enjoyed in the one true God. And it was in the name of that one true God, the Lord of hosts, that David came at the giant Goliath. He came at the giant with a sling and a stone and the guidance of the Holy Spirit of God. And there was no contest. That single stone he flung at the giant warrior of the Philistines was placed exactly where it needed to go to bring Goliath to the ground. Knocked out and prone gave David the opportunity to use the giant's own sword to behead him, which is exactly the threat that the giant breathed against David in the beginning and the army of Israel. And that sent the whole army of the Philistines fleeing before the army of Saul and the nation of Israel. The Lord of hosts turned the threats of the Philistines upon themselves. They brought upon themselves exactly the punishment they breathed upon Israel through the mouth of the giant. By this time in the Bible story, we already know that this David had been anointed by God and infused with the Holy Spirit to replace Saul who had fallen out of favor with God as king for his disobedience. This story is one of those mythic tales that raise David to an almost supernatural level in the eyes of the people of Israel. And it is a tale of David's reliance on the Lord of hosts for his strength. But when we say Lord of hosts, what are we talking about? Generally, I think we are referring to the angel armies of heaven. Those warriors equipped and empowered by God himself for defending those who believe and live by faith in God. It is an undetectable army by human standards, unable to be seen by human eyes or perceived by human senses of any other kind, but who exist on the plane of the spirit, moved and employed by God to fight the spiritual battles beyond the scope of human strength. 
But David here refers to the God of the armies of Israel, the power behind the soldiers who fought for the king, the army the enemy could see. He had to bring it down to a level that the Philistines could understand and fear. David was saying that what you see is often less than what you get. There is a power here that you cannot comprehend, but you are going to see it soon. This may even be a source for that saying that if God is for us, who can be against us? Even though that is a direct quote from Romans 8.31, but it certainly applies in this story of David and Goliath. David did not perceive any disadvantage for himself going against the giant, for David saw his God as greater than the enemy that he could see in front of him. He had faced enemies that did not have God with them before. Those lions and bears that lived without God's power behind them. He saw this Philistine as one of them, therefore not to be feared. The Philistine giant had gods with a lowercase g, of course what we would call idols. The gods of Goliath were imitators of the true God who ruled Israel. And powerless and insignificant and of no use in Goliath's defense against the true God who stood behind David. And David ran in full conviction of that fact into battle against the taunting Philistine. It took just one stone to prove David right. One stone felled the giant with all his armor and shield bearer protecting him in front as well. One stone drawn from that shepherd's pouch and flung at the giant with a sling. One stone found its mark in the middle of the taunting giant's forehead, and he fell with a great thud to the earth. David ensured the giant's death with the giant's own sword and cut off his head to turn his threats upon himself, to leave his body a target of the birds of the air and the animals of the forest, as Goliath said he would do to the shepherd before the battle began. Where then does that leave us? 3,000 years later, we don't fight our battles on the plains of Israel. We don't face taunting giants. We don't strap on swords or carry pouches filled with stones or a slingshot or a wooden club. But there is one similarity in our battles today to the battle that David faced with the giant. We have the same God who David relied upon. God has not changed in all those intervening years. Hebrews tells us that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And though Jesus the Christ was not yet made manifest in the days of David, Jesus Christ and God the Father are always and have always been one and the same. See some references in John 14 and 17, among other places. And we have the same God behind us in our battles. 
whatever they are, as David has had in his battle with the giant. Do you have the same kind of faith that David exhibited in, in his time on the battlefield? This past year and some months have surely tested our own. I pray that it has strengthened it and you are more sure of God's presence today than you have ever been. We have these stories in the Old Testament to remind us of God's presence and love with us. When your stamina seems to ebb, it is always a good thing to check back and read them again for the assurance of God's presence with us. Amen? Amen. Now in the spirit of a God who stands behind us, Jeff and Barbara will share and we shall overcome. We shall overcome, we shall overcome, we shall overcome someday. Oh, deep in my heart, I do believe that we shall I might add that the Lord will see us through every Amen. Let us join now in our congregational prayer for renewal, as you find in your bulletins, as we say together, O Lord above, we come before you today at a fork in the road. We can choose to go in the way that seems best to us, or we can choose to listen to your advice. We know in our hearts that you are leading is the best way. You see the consequences of our poor choices and you lead us into the blessings of our right choices. Help us, O oh Lord, to choose you and your leadership over the fork that seems best to us. Help us to listen to you to trust that you know what you are doing and guide us to choose the correct way, the way that you call us to take. In the precious name of your only Son, our Savior, we pray. Amen. Now may the God of grace and glory, the God of love and salvation, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, who was sent to be with us. May you know that spirit in your life today and from this day on in Jesus name, amen.
Grace and peace be with you all. May you be cool this first week of summer. Amen. <laughs>